At number 10 is Genghis Khan. Our journey commences with the infamous Genghis Khan, a name synonymous with conquest and dominance. However, the mystery surrounding his ultimate resting place is as perplexing as his legacy. Contrary to the ostentatious mausoleums of other historical figures that you'll get to see today, Genghis Khan's burial site remains a deeply guarded secret. Deliberately concealed to avert any potential desecration, the details of his internment are veiled in ambiguity. Historical records are in consistent and contradictory, highlighting a sense of intrigue. Some accounts propose a mountaintop sanctuary as his final abode, while others suggest his remains repose beneath a river's tranquil flow. This deliberate confusion echoes the shroud that cloaked his life, revealing a complex tapestry of power and ruthlessness. Genghis Khan's indelible footprint on history is undeniable, yet his elusive resting place mirrors the enigmatic path he carved through the currents of time. If you're enjoying this video so far, please support the channel by pressing like, subscribe, Subscribing to Most Amazing and ringing that notification bell. At number 9 is Joseph Stalin. In 1953, when Stalin took his final breath, his corporeal form found a home in Moscow's Red Square Mausoleum, nestled beside Lenin. This eerie cohabitation of a man responsible for uncountable demises with a revolutionary leader is a testament to the paradoxes of history. Yet, as social winds shifted, so did the narrative. In 1961, Stalin was unceremoniously ousted from the mausoleum finding a new repose near the Kremlin Wall. Once grandiose homage faded, replaced by a subdued grave, an embodiment of evolving perspectives. Stalin's legacy endures, his sepulture a haunting reminder of the past, where veneration metamorphosized into contemplation and horror dances with history. At number 8 is Osama Bin Laden. The name itself conjures a storm of memories and emotions, inexorably tied to the horrors of September 11, 2001. Bin Laden's journey ended not in a grand fortress of evil, but in an inconspicuous compound nestled in Abbottabad, Pakistan. This nondescript hideout where the orchestrator of one of the world's most infamous acts of terror took his last breath exemplifies the eerie dissonance between the enormity of his actions and the banality of his surroundings. Following his demise, the United States faced a peculiar dilemma. How to handle the burial of a man responsible for unfathomable suffering whose gravesite could serve as the hub for his followers. The solution? An eerie and unceremonious departure from tradition. See, instead of a terrestrial internment, Bin Laden's body found its eternal abode beneath the waves, submerged in the depths of the Arabian Sea. And after a rabbi had proceeded with any rituals ascertaining Osama's faith, as to not stir any more unnecessary anger. At number 7 is Kim Jong-il. The enigmatic and notorious leader who helmed North Korea from 1994 until his passing in 2011. Kim Jong-il's legacy is woven into the threads of oppression, human rights violations, and an insidious personality cult. His reign, characterized by the suppression of dissent and the manipulation of information, earned him a place among history's most nefarious figures. But what about his resting place? It can be found atop the secret Mount Paektu, a formidable stratovolcano straddling the borders of North Korea and China, where Kim Jong-il's mausoleum resides. A monumental structure echoing the orchestrated mythology he meticulously crafted during his lifetime. It's as if his mysterious aura persists beyond the veil of his demise, as his final abode stands as an eerie homage to his reign of fear and control. The chilling resonance of his resting place serves as a cryptic reminder of the enigma that defined his life and the haunting grip he held over his nation. At number 6 is Saddam Hussein. The tale of his afterlife commences in the remote reaches of Tikrit, Iraq. Nestled there in a modest religious structure housing his earthly remains as his final resting place, it's actually the same spot he was born. The eerie tranquility of his burial site bellies the shadows of his malevolent past. Saddam Hussein, the once feared dictator of Iraq, who was sentenced to hanging after being convicted of crimes against humanity by his own people, Saddam ruled through tyranny and oppression. His final abode stands as a somber testament to the far-reaching consequences of his actions. The tomb's benign facade and desolate surrounding offer a stark contrast to the horrors he orchestrated. It beckons contemplation on the profound impact of human behavior in the course of history. And as we ponder this terrifying final resting place, we're reminded of the depths to which humanity can sink. The legacy and cruelty he left behind endures, prompting us to scrutinize the darkness that can reside within individuals and societies alike. At number 5 is Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong stands as a haunting figure responsible for the demises of countless during his reign. The sheer scale of his actions boggles the mind. 
The great leap forward and the cultural revolution, fueled by misguided policies, led to famine, persecution, and devastation. But where does the man who orchestrated such chaos rest now? Mao's final abode is within a grand mausoleum, within a simple stone sarcophagus. Situated in the heart of the Tiananmen Square, his body lies preserved for all to see, invoking a mixture of reverence and unease. It's a paradoxical reflection of his legacy, the once powerful ruler reduced to a silent relic, his past glory overshadowed by the suffering he inflicted. And as we gaze upon the stark memorial, we're reminded that even the most sinister chapters of history find their resting places, etching through the cautionary tales of the annals of time. And number four, Ivan the Terrible. Now, now what sets Ivan apart in the annals of history? Well, this 16th century Russian Tsar's reign was a chilling saga of brutality, marked by political purges, cruel tortures. It's no wonder he's earned the moniker, The Terrible. As for his resting place, Ivan finds himself entombed in the Archangel Cathedral within Moscow's Kremlin, an architectural masterpiece. This might seem like an extravagant choice for someone with such a dark legacy, but it's a reminder that history, much like human nature, isn't always straightforward. The ornate surroundings mirror the complexity of his actions, a profound reminder that even amidst grandeur, malevolence can take root. At number three is Vlad the Impaler, history's very own Dracula, infamous for his brutal reign in the 15th century. His chilling nickname owes its Itself to his preferred method of execution, impalement. The unsettling final resting place of such individuals raise intriguing questions about the nature of evil. See, Vlad's heinous acts, which included impaling his enemies and displaying them as gruesome deterrents, earned him a place in the annals of history as a true embodiment of horror. The stark contrast between the horrors he inflicted and the serene landscapes that now house his remains makes us ponder the weight of his malevolence. How does one reconcile the darkness that resides within the human psyche with the tranquil surroundings that now envelop these malevolent souls? Chilling reminder that history's echoes linger in the most unexpected places. At number two is Paul Plot. His malevolent legacy as the leader of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia is etched into history's darkest annals. Under his regime, an estimated quarter of the country's population faced unaliveness due to executions, forced labor, and unimaginable suffering. Now about his final abode. It's a peculiar tale that benefits his enigmatic profile. See, unlike the grand tombs of other infamous figures, Paul Plot's resting place is far from ostentatious. Tucked away in the jungles near the Thai border, he was cremated in a rudimentary pit. This unassuming pit serves as a reminder of the profound complexities of evil. See, the man who orchestrated immense atrocities finds himself in a modest grave prompting contemplation of the legacy of malevolence and the eerie quietude that often follows. And at number one is Emperor Nero, a figure whose legacy is shrouded in infamy. A name that sends shivers down the spines of history enthusiasts was not exactly known for his virtuous deeds. This Roman emperor's reign was marked by a series of ghastly actions that have left an indelible mark on the annals of time. But why the shudder-worthy reputation, you ask? Well, let's start with the infamous Great Fire of Rome in 64 AD. While the city burned, Nero allegedly played his fiddle, a move that became synonymous with apathy and cruelty. What's even more chilling is his response, blaming the Christians and subsequently subjecting them to brutal persecution. But that's not all. Nero didn't hesitate to eliminate his own mother, Agrippina, a move that's a masterclass in matricidal treachery. His questionable artistic pursuits, including singing and racing chariots, added a layer of absurdity to his sinister profile. But now brace yourselves as we approach Nero's final resting place. This is where the story makes a spine chill. Turn. See, picture the mausoleum of Domiti Aheno Barbi, grandiose structure that houses the remains of the infamous ruler. It's quite a spectacle considering the scope of his misdeeds. Number 10, John Wayne Gacy. John Wayne Gacy was known as the Clown Slayer due to his public performances as Pogo the Clown or Patches the Clown personas he had devised prior to the discovery of his crimes. Now, he ended the lives of at least 33 young men and boys in Norwood Park Township, Illinois. Now, typically, he would lure a victim victim to his home and duped them into donning handcuffs on the pretext of demonstrating a magic trick. He would then take advantage of them and take their lives. Now, The investigation into the disappearance of Des Plaines student Robert Peast led to Gacy's arrest on December 21st, 1978. 26 victims were buried in a crawl space of his home and three others were buried elsewhere on his property and four were discarded in the Des Plaines River. Now, He inspired a little character named Pennywise from the IT book series and film. Films. Pennywise also preys on the young of Derry, Maine, roughly every 27 years, using a variety of powers 
that include the ability to shapeshift, manipulate reality, and go unnoticed by adults. Now, overall, clowns can be scary, but with Pennywise being based on a real person, it makes it even more terrifying. Number nine, Ronald DeFeo. On the night of November 13th, 1974, 23-year-old Ronald DeFeo shot and ended the life of all six members of his family. He was then arrested, convicted, and given six concurrent life sentences. Then, in December of 1975, George and Kathy Lutz, along with their three children, moved into the house and claimed that spooky things were happening. For example, George would wake up at 3.15 a.m. every morning, which was the approximate time Ronald ended his family. Kathy said she would feel a ghostly presence and be embraced by it, and all of this and more caused the family to flee in fear after only staying in the house for 28 days. Now, due to this, demonologist Ed and Lorraine Warren visited the house and set up time-lapse infrared cameras. Now, there have been many films called The Amityville Horror based on this story, and usually it even uses the real people's names in the film and dramatizes the events that took place that night. Number 8. The Manson Family Charles Manson was a criminal who created a cult called the Manson Family. It was active in California in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Now, the group consisted of approximately 100 followers who lived an unconventional lifestyle and frequently used psychoactive substances. Now, according to group member Susan Atkins, the members of the family became convinced that Manson was the manifestation of Jesus Christ and believed in his prophecies concerning an intimate, apocalyptic race war. Now, some of the members committed a series of nine deaths at four locations in July and August 1969. Now, in 1971, Manson was convicted of first-degree homicide and conspiracy to commit homicide for the deaths of seven people, including film actress Sharon Tate. Now, the prosecution contended that while Manson never directly ordered the deaths, his ideology constituted an overact of conspiracy. Now, it's said that the movie The Strangers is based on this cult. In the movie, three masked individuals randomly target a couple and end their lives without reason or rhyme, just how the Manson family would. Number seven, Danny Rowling. In August 1990, Danny Rowling, aka the Gainesville Ripper, ended the lives of five students during a burglary and robbery spree. He mutilated his victims' bodies, decapitating one. He then posed them, sometimes using mirrors. Now, all the victims were petite white brunettes with brown eyes, like Rowling's mother. In November 1991, Danny was charged with five counts of homicide, and he claimed that his motive was to become a superstar similar to Ted Bundy. Now, in 1994, before his trial could get underway, Rowling unexpectedly pleaded guilty to all charges. On April 20th, 1994, Rowling was sentenced to death, and Danny actually inspired the movie Scream. Set in the small American town of Woodsboro, Scream's plot follows high school student Sydney Prescott and her friends, who become, on the anniversary of her mother's death, the target of a costume serial slayer known as Ghostface. Now, Ghostface often calls and taunts his victims before attacking them, focusing mainly on young females who are alone and vulnerable, much like Rowling did. Like in real life, these students were on high alert and staying in groups. And now, what's ironic about this is that the movie Scream actually inspired high schoolers to end the lives of their classmates, which is just disturbing. Number six. Alfredo Trevino. You may not know who Alfredo Trevino is, so let me explain. In the early 1960s, medical intern Alfredo was the last person in Mexico to be sentenced with the death penalty. Alfredo was known as Dr. Salazar when he was in prison, but to the outside world, he was more familiar as the Wolfman of Nuevo Leon. This doctor was sentenced to death for ending the life of his lover, Jesus Castillo Rangel, and mutilating the body. He's also suspected of ending the lives of several hitchhikers in the late 1950s and 1960s and was accused of secretly burying his victims' bodies. His sentence was then commuted to 20 years, though, and he was not sentenced to death. Now, it seems that Hannibal Lecter from The Silence of the Lambs was based on Alfredo. You see, Thomas Harris had been a journalist in the 1960s, and once he had to meet a gruesomely wounded prisoner, Dykes Askew Simmons, in a prison in Mexico. Treating Simmons was a doctor named Dr. Salazar, whom Harris mistook to be a staff member. While the doctor treated Simmons, the journalist and the the doctor had quite an intellectual conversation concerning Simmons' victims, but little did Harris know that the doctor was a criminal himself, and thus he based the story on him. Number five, Ronald Doe. In the late 1940s in the United States, priests of the Roman Catholic Church performed a series of exorcisms on an anonymous boy documented under the name Ronald Doe. The boy was the alleged victim of a demonic possession, and the events were recorded by the attending priest. It said after a family death, the family experienced strange 
strange noises, furniture moving of its own accord, and ordinary objects such as vases flying or levitating when the boy was nearby. The family then turned to their pastor for help. Now, during the exorcism, the boy allegedly slipped one of his hands out of the restraints, broke a bedspring from under the mattress, and used it as an impromptu weapon, slashing the priest's arm, and resulting in the exorcism ritual being halted. When they did another exorcism, it was stated that during the scene, words such as evil and hell, along with other various marks, appeared on the teenager's body. Allegedly, during the litany of the saints portion of the exorcism ritual, the boy's mattress began to shake. Now, the premise of the film The Exorcist is based on this possession case, which truly says how frightening it is. Number 4. The Lake Bottom Slayer On June 5th, 1960, at Bottom Lake, four friends went camping, but only one made it out alive. Three of them died by stabbing and blunt force trauma to their heads while sleeping inside a tent. The fourth friend was found outside the tent with broken facial bones and stab wounds. Now, despite extensive investigations, the perpetrator was never identified, and various theories on the Slayer's identity have been presented over the years. But it remains one of the most infamous unsolved homicides in Finnish criminal history. Now, does that story sound familiar? Well, that's because it's said to have inspired Friday the 13th films and Jason Voorhees. The coincidences get even more eerie because the surviving victim described the Slayer as a genuine boogeyman shrouded in black with glowing red eyes, which sounds absolutely terrifying. Number 3. Swanee Bean Swanee Bean was said to be the head of a 45 member clan in Scotland in the 16th century that ended the lives of and ate over 1,000 people in 25 years. According to the legend, Bean and his clan members were eventually caught by a search party sent by King James VI. Swanee and his fellow men had their genitalia cut off and thrown into fires, their hands and feet severed, and were allowed to bleed to death, with Swanee shouting his dying words, it isn't over, it will never be over. Now, after watching the man die, Agnes, his partner, and her fellow women were tied to stakes and burned alive. Now, while there is little historical evidence that confirms or denies Swanee's existence, his myth persists. But it's said that Swanee and his group influenced the film The Hills Have Eyes. This film is about a family on a road trip stranded in the Nevada desert who become hunted by a clan of deformed people who eat other people in the surrounding hills. Number two. Annabelle. The Annabelle doll is probably one of the best known haunted dolls in history. Bought in an antique shop in 1970, a woman gave a Raggedy Ann doll to her daughter, Donna, who was in nursing school. Now, Donna and her roommate, Angie, kept coming home to find the doll in different positions and in different locations. The doll began leaving them notes reading help, and a psychic told them that the doll was possessed by the spirit of a girl named Annabelle, who had died at the location where their apartment complex had been built. Now, with the doll becoming more and more violent, the girls called and Lorraine Warren, who decided the doll was actually a conduit to hell that a demon was using. Two exorcisms didn't work, and the Warrens took Annabelle home. Now, the Warrens had a specially made glass and wood case constructed, upon which they inscribed the Lord's Prayer and St. Michael's Prayer. Now, for the rest of his life, Ed would periodically say a binding prayer over the case, ensuring that the sinister spirit and the doll remained good and trapped. So, all the Annabelle movies are based on that doll, except the movie doll is porcelain and even more terrifying. Now, there have been three separate Annabelle movies, and she's become a staple of the Conjuring universe that will continue to scare me until I die. And coming at number one is Ed Jean. Ed Jean was a serial slayer and grave robber. He created costumes, furniture, and other keepsakes from bodies of his victims. While he was only officially convicted of taking the lives of two people, Bernice Warden and Mary Hogan, a police raid on his house turned up masks literally made from human faces, a belt of nipples, and a corset created from a skinned torso. Now, to be clear, he never wore these costumes when ending people's lives. Instead, he donned them in the privacy of his home. Now, some masks appeared mummified, almost dried out, while others were more carefully preserved. A few had lipstick applied and looked more lifelike, and four had been stuffed with paper and hung on the wall of his bedroom, almost like hunting trophies. Now, Ed was initially found unfit to stand trial and confined to a mental health facility, but by 1968, he was judged competent to stand 
trial, and he was found guilty of the deaths, but he was found legally insane and was remanded to a psychiatric institution. Now, due to all this, he made a lasting impression on the American psyche and inspired fictional villains such as Norman Bates, Buffalo Bill, and Leatherface. There are many, many villains based off of him as he is so iconic. First up in our number 10 spot is The Stone Man. Active between the years of 1985 to 1988 in Mumbai, India, this mysterious criminal is believed to be responsible for the death of 26 people, yet has never been found. The Stone Man got their name due to the cruel methods they used. They would target homeless people sleeping alone on the streets at night and use concrete blocks or stones, sometimes weighing up to 65 pounds, to carry out their gruesome plan. According to the media, 12 people died at the hands of the Stone Man in Mumbai between 1985 to 1988, and then they moved to Calcutta where another 12 people were found dead in a single year. Now, it's not known for certain if the Calcutta killer was the same as whoever committed the atrocities in Mumbai. Authorities did mention it could have been a copycat, but most seem to believe it was all one person or at least a group of people working together. Sadly, even now, no one has been charged for any of the 26 crimes and all remain unsolved, leaving this evil killer on the loose. Moving on to number 9, The Eastbound Strangler. In 2006, one fateful night, this unidentified monster took the life of four women and was never seen or heard from again. The killer targeted four New Jersey escorts and left their bodies behind the Golden Key Motel, face down in a row, facing east and about 60 feet apart from each other. The victims were left fully clothed, minus having their socks and shoes removed, and all appear to have been killed in the same way. Early on, there was speculation that it was linked to the Long Island killer, another unknown attacker, but was later ruled out by investigators. Despite 15 years of investigation, they have never been able to come close to any leads, and whoever was responsible has never been caught. Next up at number 8, Jane Toppin. Likely responsible for nearly 31 deaths, Jane, or Jolly Jane as she's often referred to, had a very unique motive. To have killed more people, helpless people, than any other man or woman who ever lived. She came from a very abusive household, and after her mother's death, she and her sisters were given up to an orphanage. Not much is known about what went on during her time there, but just two years after she was admitted, she was hired as a servant for a family in Massachusetts. As an adult, Jane began studying nursing, but soon she began fixating on elderly and sick patients, using them as test subjects for morphine and atropine injections to see what it would do to their nervous systems. Upon her arrest, she confessed that she would poison her victims before laying down with them and fondling their helpless bodies until they passed, admitting she derived pleasure from patients on the brink of death and felt as though she could see the inner workings of their souls through their eyes. During trial, she insisted on being declared sane as she wanted the possibility of release, but the jury ruled her unfit for trial and had her committed to an institution where she remained until her death. Coming in at number 7, Texas Killing Fields. What would seem like a normal 25 acre patch of land just off the highway near Houston, Texas is actually a haunting death field where more than 30 bodies have been found since the early 1970s. Nearly all of the victims found have been young women and there are apparently many more missing women from the area, but no remains beyond the 30 victims have ever been recovered. Despite the authorities' best effort, it is un known how many perpetrators have contributed to the field, though it is suspected that more than one person is responsible. To date, only three of the cases have been successful in convicting an attacker, and the remaining 27 remain unsolved with no leads and no luck of where to turn next. Recently, in 2011, a film was made about the series of crimes associated with the notorious plot of land, but it was not received well and unfortunately did not kickstart anything more than up set families of the victims and a few false confessions to the atrocities. Moving on to number 6. 
the Honolulu Strangler. Credited with being responsible for the death of five women, this unidentified killer was active only between 1985 to 1986, but was never caught. The sadistic perpetrator was known to target women, but that seems to be where the links stop. All of his victims were brutally attacked and taken advantage of, and then left tied up on the street to be found by the police. Understandably, authorities took this case very seriously, as at the time it was the first known repeat criminal of his kind in Honolulu, so local authorities put together a 27 person task force. But even with all that manpower, they were never able to find the attacker. There was hope when a man named Howard Gay was arrested, as he seemed to fit the profile, but he was eventually released after further interrogation. Years later, in 2017, the case was covered by a true crime podcast, and once again in 2022, but despite its popularity, we have no idea what happened to the Honolulu Strangler, and they still likely roam free. Moving on to number 5. Bible John. Active between 1968 to 1969 in Glasgow, Scotland, a man nicknamed Bible John is believed to be responsible for the death of three young women, all of whom were young brunettes who he would lure at a local dance hall in the city. The unidentified criminal is referred to as Bible John, as according to a key witness, they saw a man who picked up women, yet quoted extensively from the Old Testament and frowned on adults. But apparently taking the lives of these young women seemed alright in his books. For decades, the Glasgow police have tirelessly searched for the monster, but have remained unsuccessful in tracking him down. To date, the search for Bible John has been the most extensive manhunt in Scottish criminal history. It was also the first time in Scotland's history that a composite drawing of the perpetrator was allowed and publicized in an attempt to get more information from the public. Although there have been a few suspects over the years, none have been convicted, and to this day it is unknown who is responsible for these horrible attacks. Moving on to number four. Isai Sagawa. Unlike others on this list, he is only known for one brutal attack, but what he did will leave you speechless. Sagawa was born in Japan and says he had known since childhood of his gruesome instincts, but for whatever reason would always back out of his desires at the last second. All of this changed, however, when he moved to Paris to pursue his PhD and met Rene Hartvelt. Sagawa says he picked her due to her her beauty and stature as he saw himself as weak, ugly, and small, and believed he could absorb her energy. He invited her over on the pretense of dinner, but knew all along what he planned to do. He took the woman's life and devoured her flesh over the next several days. But after four days, the body began to decompose, and he knew he had to get her out of his apartment or risk being arrested for his crimes. However, he was caught attempting to dump her remains in a nearby lake and was, of course, arrested immediately. After awaiting trial for two years, a judge ruled him legally insane and unfit for trial, ordering him to live out the rest of his life in an institution. But here is where it gets crazy. Once in this institution, the psychologists deemed him fully sane and that his perversions were the reason for his his crimes, not insanity. But since charges had been dropped while in France, all documents were sealed and nothing was sent to Japanese authorities, meaning that legally, the institution could not detain him any longer. So after only two years, Sagawa walked out and remains free to this day. Moving on to number three, the monster of Florence. Active between 1968 to 1985 in Florence, Italy, this man is responsible for the death of eight young couples who he targeted while they snuck away into the woods trying to be intimate outside their homes. Now, in 1970s Italy, this could often be a common occurrence, as it was customary for young couples to not live with each other until marriage, and with nowhere else to go, sometimes the great outdoors was their only alternative. The part about this that really gets under your skin is that the female victims would be found mutilated with their intimate areas removed with a surgical precision that led police to believe he had a medical 
background. More than 100,000 men were investigated for these crimes, with some being arrested and even tried. But eventually, another killing would occur, exonerating them and forcing police to continue the search for the perpetrator. The search continued for this gruesome monster, and a local farmer named Pietro Pacini was convicted in 1994 for six of the killings, but later in 1996 was overturned. Pacini died a few years later, but it is strongly believed that he did not work alone, and while five accused men have been jailed at one point in time, they were all eventually released, leaving this cade wide open with the alleged convict running free. Coming in at number two, the Frankfurt Slasher. Between 1985 and 1990, this monster preyed upon women in a rough neighborhood in Philadelphia. The Frankfurt Slasher was known for being incredibly violent, mutilating the victims beyond recognition, and what was designed to be on the inside of the body would often end up exposed. Then after having his way with the victims, he would leave them on the street, strategically posed for when the police would find them. Believed to be responsible for the death of nine women, the Frankfurt Slasher targeted specifically white women, usually escorts or women with a public history of mental illness, but oddly the age of his victims ranged from 28 to 68. One man, Leonard Christopher, was convicted of one of the crimes in 1990, but more happened once he was put away, causing concern that they found the wrong man. Further significant questions have popped up regarding the quality of evidence used to convict Christopher. He apparently did not match witness reports of the white man seen with other victims, meaning the Frankfurt slasher was never found and never sent to prison. And last up in our number one spot is Pedro Lopez. Nicknamed the Monster of Andes, Pedro Lopez might be one of the most notorious criminals alive. After being kicked out of his childhood home at eight years old for taking advantage of his sister, Lopez was evicted and sent to live the rest of his childhood on the streets of Colombia. According to Lopez, not long after he was thrown out, he was abducted and assaulted, but by 13 was taken in by a family who he ran away from two years later. By 1978, Lopez claims to have been responsible for the death of a hundred girls. That same year, an indigenous tribe caught him and was going to execute him, but a nearby missionary took pity on him and demanded they release him and call him into the authorities. The police, however, for whatever reason, promptly released him from custody. From there, he fled to Colombia once again, followed by Ecuador, where he reports to have attacked about three girls a week, and when he was caught and arrested in 1980, he confessed to killing 200 victims, but there is suspicion that it could have been as many as 360. Though he did remain jailed for 14 years, in 1994, he was released from prison for good behavior and sent back to Colombia to serve the rest of his sentence in a psychiatric facility. But only four years later, in 1998, he was ruled legally sane and released on a $50 bail. Rather predictably, he fled the country after his release and a warrant for his arrest was promptly released. His whereabouts remain a mystery and no one knows if he has committed any more attacks since he vanished. And we're starting off with a story shared to Reddit from user Ravenshadow2013, love that name. Here they describe an encounter they had with a dark entity they refer to as the blue lady. My oldest sister used to live in a rental that while babysitting my sister and I would tell us to stay away from the basement door. One day my sister's curiosity got the better of her and she talked me into opening the door. Standing at the top of the stairs was what we used to call a blue lady. I was seven-ish, she was five-ish. Later on, our older sister told us that the blue lady would wander the house at night, humming some sort of nursery lullaby. So yeah, I don't know what it is about lullabies or just singing or humming in general, but there's something so unsettling about hearing something like that at night coming from somewhere in the house, even if it is not even paranormal, just waking up to the sound of someone in your house humming twinkle twinkle little star themselves alone in the dark, uh, sends a bit of a sure down my spine. Next up we have the hallway entity. Now, there's not a whole lot of info about the story surrounding this video. It's just a security camera piece of footage of, of some kind of ghostly attack. 
taking place. We see a man walking down what looks to be an empty apartment hallway. You see this black shadowy shape start to form which sends the man falling to the floor before it starts dragging him down the hallway. Now this video could totally be fake. I mean it's, it's, it's not out of the question to pull off a hoax like this but it is well done and if it is real it's probably one of the most compelling pieces of ghostly evidence in existence. Next we have the closet entity. A TikToker by the name of DM Wesley posted several videos documenting his experiences with some sort of entity in his apartment. He had moved into the building in August of 2022 and began hearing a loud banging sound coming from his closet. In this video, the loud bangs are super aggressive. It sounds like someone is in the closet and uh, ain't happy about being there. Our cameraman gets up, walks over to the closet, and abruptly opens it. Only to reveal, of course, there's nothing there. It sounds like he's been through this on many occasions because uh, this, he sounds more fed up than scared. I would, I would definitely not have the courage to just swing the closet door open like that. If I'd heard a couple of knocks, sure, but loud persistent banging like that, it, forget it. Next up, we have a story posted to Reddit by user Sal's Pizzeria. I wonder where this apartment story comes from, it's New York in case you didn't guess. It goes as follows. I used to live in an old apartment and tried to shrug off all the creepy sounds and motions I thought I was experiencing. I'd dismiss everything as wind, creaky floors, creaky building, or something off in the distance. One day I heard a faint knock on my door. Opened the door, nobody there. No footsteps heard in the nearby staircase. And there was no place for a person to hide. Other two apartments next to me had no residence. I was a little creeped out by it. Days later, I mentioned it to someone who lived a few floors below. She informed me that years before, a person had gone up to the apartment door, knocked, and then fell over, dead from a heart attack. It was believed that the man had chest pains and was seeking help, but all he could do was knock on the door. Every time there was a knock, even with people there waiting to enter, I got an uneasy feeling. Glad I'm not there anymore. I would be too. Sticking with the New York theme, we have the 14 West 10th Street apartment in New York City. This is said to be one of the most haunted apartment buildings in Manhattan. Constructed in the late 19th century, this building has quite the history. One of the most famous stories involves Mark Twain, who supposedly resided in the apartment and is said to haunt the premises. Some residents say they've uh, seen his apparition moving throughout the building. Uh, and he did live there towards the end of his life, uh, although he didn't actually die there. So if ghosts are a thing, I'm guessing it's the spirit of a different old man. There are said to be about 22 ghosts who reside there. For example, a lady in white. There's also, uh, there's, there's always a lady in white, isn't there? A kid accompanied by a gray cat and the spirit of a young girl who died there at the hands of her father, former New York criminal defense attorney, Joel Steinberg, just to name a few. At number five, we have the Dakota apartment complex, also in New York City, finishing construction in 1884 the building has attracted a number of tales about paranormal activity over the years. One of the most famous stories revolves around the death of John Lennon, who resided in the Dakota before his tragic death in 1980. Many claim to have seen Lennon's ghost wandering the halls of the apartment. Other reported sightings include a young boy in outdated clothing playing in the courtyard and a woman dressed in 19th century clothing on the building's rooftop. Residents have reported unexplained noises. Of course, objects are always moving on their own and feelings that there's someone there watching them. Aside from all the ghost stories, the building uh, also just looks like it would be haunted. It's got that gothic architectural style which definitely gives it a bit of an eerie kind of vibe. This story was posted to Reddit again by user tier one clean who describes a paranormal experience they had when they were young in their apartment in Atlanta, Georgia. One night I woke up in the middle of the night around 2.30 a.m. because I got thirsty and had to pee. As I step out into the hallway, I see what I thought to be my mom's boyfriend sitting on the sofa watching TV. I approached him to ask what he was watching and got no response. Then I got closer and said it again with a little more authority in my voice because in my mind, 
It's very rude to ignore someone talking to you. When I was standing about two feet away, I felt off and noticed that I still couldn't see his face or body even though the TV was on. I could only see a shadow silhouette. I froze because the air now felt heavy and it turned towards me. It let out a terrifying scream and flew down the hall towards the hall closet by my mom's room. I stood there in shock for about 20 seconds before I started crying and screaming. I woke up the entire apartment. My mom asked what happened and I told her. When I told her, the look on her face was not surprise, but a look of, so you've seen it too. She tells me and my siblings that she felt a man standing over her bed at night breathing on her. The boyfriend said on one of his off days he was shaving in the mirror and saw the shadow of someone standing in the shower. The next morning we immediately went to the renter's office. My mom had me tell the guy what I saw and she was saying stuff like I've told you this apartment was weird and whatnot. She was very heated. The guy then tells my mom that six months before we moved in that the previous guy living there was killed during a home invasion. They stuffed his body into that hall closet and he wasn't found until two weeks later by maintenance people because of the smell of his body. Next up we have the ghost caught on live stream. This next video is posted to YouTube by J Rob and is a segment from a live stream. Things were totally normal until the group spotted something on one of their cameras. Pay close attention to Chris D's camera on the bottom left corner. Yeah, you could see this shadowy figure walk through the background and it looks to have a humanoid form but it does not look like a person. You see Chris kind of look behind him too after the thing moves by as if he felt something swoosh by him. Clearly looks confused and freaked out and then one of the friends Junebug is immediately like was that a ghost? It's worth watching the full clip because uh, they, they replay it and their reactions are pretty entertaining. Now technology isn't perfect especially on webcams and there's low lighting. It, it can cause glitches and weird illusions but I I gotta admit, I'd be pretty freaked out if I played back a live stream and saw some shadowy mass moving across my screen, especially because he felt it move. It wasn't just the camera acting up. Coming in at number two, we have another story posted to Reddit by user KDKDKDKDS. It goes as follows. I lived in a basement apartment in Astoria that had a regular haunting. Apparently my ex swore she saw ghosts and would see an older man wandering around the back door, which opened to the back garden late at night. Most of the time he ignored her, but one night she woke up to him staring at her from the edge of the bed. She started to freak out and walked over to the back door and stood near it then disappeared. When we woke up the next day, it turns out I had left the door unlocked. Anyway, later I heard that an older man had died there right before I moved in and no one found him for weeks. So I guess that was him. The other thing that happened there was that right after I moved in, there was a terrible car accident that killed a female cab driver and a young woman who lived on the street. Some a-hole t-boned the cab as the younger woman was getting out and she and the driver died. Anyway, same ex woke up in the middle of the night and she saw two faces near the ceiling glowing so you could see them in the darkness looking sad. Then they vanished. We only learned about the accident when we went outside to get breakfast. She recognized the faces of the victims after seeing them on the news. And finally, I'm going to tell my personal story now. So uh, when I was living with uh, this girl I was dating at the time, we'd have weird experiences in the apartment. Xbox would turn on and then turn off on its own on occasion. That happened a number of times. She would also hear loud banging uh, sounds in the house occasionally. One time I was there and I was in the room and she was in the uh, bathroom and she heard a loud bang coming from upstairs. Mind you, we're on the top floor. No one lives up there. And three pictures just fell off the wall and landed in like this perfect stack. I remember walking in and being like, oh, damn, they're like stacked up, which it could be a coincidence, but that's pretty weird. Uh, one of the other strange things, one day I just got a text from her. She'd uh, been out, comes back in the apartment and sees a, a pan, like a cooking pan, just sitting in the middle of the kitchen, perfectly placed. And I remember being pretty confused about it. I was like, okay, well, did you, did you have it sitting out? Did it fall? Nope, apparently it was in the cupboard. Somehow it just managed to get out and, and none of the cupboard doors were open either. That's the other strange part. Now the weirdest thing, okay? We had this pillow that sat on the couch. It had a band logo on it, so it was very recognizable. It was one of our favorite pillows. 
One day this thing just goes missing. We looked everywhere for that thing. I thought maybe she took it down with her in the laundry or something like that. It got lost in the laundry room, but that wasn't the case. She definitely didn't take it. We looked everywhere, under the couch, every nook and cranny of that apartment. And I was like, damn, and we'd bring it up occasionally. Like, damn, I missed that pillow. Really good pillow. Now months go by, like two or three months, okay? And I get a text from her with a, with a picture. She's like, look what showed up. She had walked back in the apartment. She was out doing something and there's the pillow sitting on the couch, like right where it would have been. And I was like, what? Now here's, here's the thing. Is the apartment haunted? I don't know. I don't really believe in hauntings specifically, but what's the other explanation? Well, someone came into the apartment, took the pillow out, fiddled with stuff and then brought it back three months later, like that doesn't make me feel any better. I don't know, what's worse, a ghost or someone just walking in the apartment and doing God knows what. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Carl Watts. Carl Watts, also known as Coral Eugene Watts, was an American serial killer who operated in the 1970s and 1980s. Born in Killeen, Texas, Watts was a quiet and unassuming individual who led a double life as a cold-blooded killer. Watts targeted and killed numerous women, primarily in Texas and Michigan. His victims were often young women and he would stalk them before attacking. Watts' crimes were characterized by their brutality and the lack of a discernible pattern, making it challenging for law enforcement to connect the cases. Despite his significant number of victims, Watts managed to evade capture for several years, partly due to his ability to blend into society and avoid suspicion. However, his luck ran out in 1982 when he was apprehended for burglary as well as an attempted killing. During questioning, he ended up confessing to multiple crimes, providing details that linked him to numerous unsolved cases. Watts eventually pleaded guilty to multiple counts and received a lengthy prison sentence. His cooperation with authorities allowed them to close several cold cases and bring closure to the families of his victims. Watts died of prostate cancer while serving his sentence on September 21st, 2007. Despite not achieving the same level of media coverage as some other infamous serial killers, Watts' actions left a trail of devastation and loss in the communities he targeted. In our number 9 spot today we have Johann Unterwerger. Johann was an Austrian serial killer who terrorized Vienna in the 1990s. Johann's criminal activities first gained attention in the late 1970s when he was convicted for taking the life of a young woman and sentenced to life in prison. However, during his incarceration he managed to project a very reformed image, becoming an accomplished writer and gaining support from intellectuals who believed he had been rehabilitated. Due to his literary talent and the perception of his redemption in a great miscarriage of justice, he was released on parole in 1990 after serving only 15 years of his life sentence. He soon became a media personality, presenting himself as a rehabilitated ex-convict and a crusader for the rights of prisoners. He even worked as a journalist and wrote articles on crime and rehabilitation, further enhancing his public image. However, beneath his character, charismatic persona, he harbored a dark and violent side. He began to commit heinous crimes again, committing a series of brutal killings that mirrored the style of his previous ones. Despite the gruesome nature of his crimes, Johann managed to evade suspicion for some time. He capitalized on his media connections to shape public opinion and divert attention from himself. However, his luck ran out when evidence linking him to the crimes started to mount. In 1992, he was arrested in Miami, Florida after being tracked down by Austrian and American authorities. He was extradited to Austria to stand trial for the killings of 11 women. The high profile trial captivated the nation and received significant media coverage within Austria. The evidence against him was overwhelming, including witness testimonies, forensic evidence, and his own confessions. He was convicted and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. On June 29th, 1994, Johann was found deceased in his prison cell, and it was later determined that he had taken his own life. In our number 8 spot today we have Anthony Sowell. Anthony Sowell was a notorious serial killer whose crimes shocked the city of Cleveland, Ohio from 2007 to 2009. Born on August 19, 1959 in East Cleveland, Sowell's criminal activities targeted vulnerable women, specifically those struggling with addiction and those involved in sex work. Sowell's crimes took place in and around his residence on Imperial Avenue, a seemingly ordinary house that hid a horrifying secret. He would lure his victims to his home under the pretense of offering them something to feed their addictions or shelter. Once inside, his horrifying
and crimes would unfold. The bodies of his victims were often hidden throughout the house, concealed in various locations, including crawl spaces and buried in the backyard. While these crimes were taking place, the local community was largely unaware of the extent of the crimes occurring in their midst. The victims, many of whom were marginalized and leading transient lives, were often overlooked by society. In October 2009, a courageous survivor managed to escape from Sowell's house and alerted the authorities. When the police executed a search warrant on Sowell's property, they made the horrifying discovery of decomposing bodies leading to his immediate arrest. The case of Anthony Sowell garnered significant attention within the Cleveland community, where the shock and horror of the crimes reverberated. Local media covered the story extensively, focusing on the heinous nature of the crimes and the impact on the victims' families. However, the case did not receive as much national or international coverage as some other high-profile serial killer cases. During Sowell's trial, the prosecution presented a compelling case against him, supported by physical evidence, DNA matches, and the testimonies of survivors. In 2011, he was found guilty on 82 counts and was sentenced to death. In our number 7 spot today, we have Maury Travis. Maury Travis was an American serial killer who terrorized the St. Louis, Missouri area in the early 2000s. His heinous crimes targeted several women and he infamously recorded some of the crimes on videotape. In the early 2000s, Travis began a spree of violence that would claim the lives of multiple women, leaving a community on edge and law enforcement agencies frantically searching for answers. It is said that Travis would often lure the young women he targeted either to secluded areas or sometimes even to his own home. Despite the gravity of his actions, Maury Travis' case did not attract widespread media attention beyond the local region. However, the local community was acutely aware of the terror that Travis had unleashed upon their city. Law enforcement agencies diligently investigated the killings, piecing together evidence and connecting the dots to build a case against him. Ultimately, it was the discovery of Travis's collection of graphic and disturbing videos that provided critical evidence linking him to the crimes. On June 30th, 2002, faced with overwhelming evidence against him, Maury Travis took his own life in his jail cell. His death marked the end of a dark chapter in St. Louis's history, but the scars left by his actions remained. Although Maury Travis's case did not receive extensive media coverage outside of the local region, the impact of his crimes on the St. Louis community cannot be understated. In our number 6 spot today, we have Kendall Francois. Kendall Francois was an American serial killer whose horrific crimes unfolded in the quiet city of Poughkeepsie, New York during the 1990s. Born on July 26, 1971, Francois led a double life, hiding a dark and sinister secret behind his seemingly ordinary facade. Francois specifically targeted women and he would lure them to his home where he subjected them to unspeakable acts of violence and ultimately took their lives. Shockingly, he managed to conceal his crimes by hiding the bodies of his victims within his residence, creating a haunting and gruesome secret that remained undiscovered for an extended period. Despite the disturbing nature of his crimes, Kendall Francois's case did not receive significant media attention at the time. The lack of widespread coverage was due in part to the marginalized nature of his victims. This made it easier for their disappearances to go unnoticed by the broader public. The true extent of his crimes only came to light in 1998 when a routine visit from police officers prompted by a complaint about a foul odor led to the shocking discovery of multiple decomposing bodies hidden throughout his home. In total, the remains of eight women were found, exposing the gruesome reality of his actions. Kendall Francois was subsequently arrested and during his trial, the disturbing details of his crimes were revealed. In 2000, he was found guilty on multiple counts and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. While Kendall Francois' case did not receive the same level of national or international media attention as some other high-profile serial killer cases, it serves as a chilling reminder of the hidden dangers that can lurk within seemingly ordinary communities. In our number 5 spot today, we have Belle Gunness. Belle Gunness was a Norwegian-American serial killer who is believed to have killed over 40 people, including her own family, in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Belle was born in Norway in 1859 and immigrated to the United States in 1881. She settled in Chicago, where she married her first husband and started a family. This was all fine and well until things soon took a turn. Belle began to collect life insurance policies on her family members, and if you're a true crime fan, you likely know where this is going. She then went on to eventually kill them in a fire. She then moved to LaPorte, Indiana, where she purchased a farm and continued to lure wealthy suitors to her property just to then kill them for their money and assets. She was known for her physical strength and was able to bury her victims' bodies on her property. 
property. Bell's crimes were discovered in 1908 when a fire destroyed her farm and the remains of several of her victims were found. We love when the villain is brought to justice, but unfortunately that did not happen here. Bell herself was never found, and it is believed that she may have faked her own death and fled the country. In our number 4 spot today we have Charles Schmid. Charles Schmid, infamously known as the Pied Piper of Tucson, was a figure of terror during the 1960s for his involvement in a string of brutal crimes that shook the city of Tucson, Arizona. Operating between 1964 and 1965, Schmidt's first victim, Aline Rowe, disappeared in the fall of 1964. Her disappearance sparked concern among her family and friends, but initially received limited attention from the media. As time went on, his violent tendencies escalated and his list of victims grew. The case gained some attention locally due to the disappearances and the growing sense of unease in Tucson. People were disturbed by the disappearances and the realization that a predator was lurking in their midst. It wasn't until one of Schmidt's acquaintances came forward with crucial information that law enforcement finally uncovered the extent of his crimes. In 1965, he was arrested and charged with the killings of Aline Rowe, Gretchen Fritz, and Wendy Fritz. The revelation of his dark secrets shocked the community and brought the nation's attention to the grisly acts committed by the Pied Piper of Tucson. During his trial, the disturbing details of his crimes were exposed, with witnesses testifying to his manipulation, his disregard for human life, and the chilling pleasure he derived from his actions. The case captivated the local media, but it did not achieve the same level of national media coverage as some of the era's more high-profile cases, such as the Manson family. Charles Schmid was found guilty of the killings and sentenced to death. However, in 1972, his sentence was commuted to life imprisonment when the death penalty was briefly abolished in the United States. Schmidt spent the rest of his life behind bars, becoming a haunting reminder of the evil that can exist within seemingly ordinary individuals. In our number 3 spot today, we have Charles Albright. Charles Albright, famously known as the Eyeball Killer, was a convicted serial killer whose heinous crimes unfolded in Dallas, Texas during the 1990s. Born on August 10, 1933, Albright appeared to lead a relatively normal life. He grew up in a middle class family, received a good education, and pursued a career in the field of ophthalmology. His chosen profession, specializing in eye care, added a very eerie twist to his later crimes. The hallmark of his crimes was the removal of his victim's eyes, leading to his chilling moniker, the eyeball killer. This disturbing signature left a lasting impression on the local community, instilling fear and disbelief in the hearts of those who heard of his deeds. However, this case did not capture the same level of national or even international attention as some other notorious killers of the time. In 1991, Albright's reign of terror came to an end when he was arrested and charged with taking the lives of three women, Mary Lou Pratt, Susan Peterson, and Shirley Williams. Albright was convicted of his crimes and sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, and he remained incarcerated until his death in 2020. In our number 2 spot today, we have Gary Ray Bowles. Gary Ray Bowles, widely known as the I-95 killer, was an American serial killer who terrorized the southeastern United States during the early 1990s. His specific targeting of gay men along the Interstate 95 corridor left a trail of fear and devastation in his wake. Despite the gravity of his crimes, Bull's case did not garner the same level of attention as some other notorious killers of the era. He began his killing spree in March of 1994, spanning over an intense eight-month period. His MO involved targeting vulnerable gay men, often befriending them and gaining their trust before subjecting them to his crimes. This spree would go on to leave a trail of tragedy and heartbreak in multiple states along the I-95 corridor. Bull's criminal activities finally came to an end in November of 1994 when he was apprehended in Florida. He was subsequently charged with multiple killings and his capture provided a sense of relief and closure to the affected communities. However, the media attention surrounding his arrest and subsequent trial remained relatively contained. During his trial, the disturbing details of his crimes were revealed, shedding light on the extent of his violence and the tragic loss of innocent lives. Gary Ray Bowles was convicted for six killings and received multiple death sentences. He spent years on death row and his case brought attention to the flaws and complexities of the criminal justice system. In 2019, he died of natural causes while awaiting execution, closing a very dark chapter in the history of serial killers in America. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have Cleophas Prince Jr. Cleophas Prince Jr., commonly known as the Claremont Killer, was an American serial killer who operated in the Claremont neighborhood of San Diego, California during the 1990s. Between January and September 1990, Prince embarked on a violent spree targeting and taking the lives of women in the 
the area. Prince would break into their homes or lure them to secluded areas. And while the case did receive attention from local media outlets, the national and international coverage remained relatively limited. Several factors could explain the lack of widespread attention. During the same period, other high profile serial killer cases, such as those of Jeffrey Dahmer and Ted Bundy, dominated the media landscape, diverting attention away from the Cleophas Prince Jr.'s crimes. Additionally, the demographic profile of Prince's victims may have played a role in the limited coverage. It wasn't until September 1990, after an exhaustive investigation and the implementation of advanced forensic techniques, that Cleophas was finally identified as the Claremont killer. He was arrested and subsequently convicted, ultimately receiving multiple life sentences without the possibility of parole. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have John George High. John George High, commonly referred to as the Acid Bath Killer, was an infamous English serial killer who operated in the 1940s. His gruesome crimes shocked the nation and earned him a chilling reputation for his method of disposing of the victims' bodies, which involved dissolving them in sulfuric acid. His victims included both men and women whom he targeted for their money and possessions. High would befriend his victims, gaining their trust before luring them to his place of work, a warehouse located in Crawley, West Sussex. High believed that if there were no physical remains, the police would have no evidence of his crimes. However, his assumption proved to be flawed. What a shocker. Police investigators found that while the acid effectively destroyed most of the victims' bodies, certain remains such as dentures, bone fragments, and other non-organic materials were resistant to the corrosive effects. Eventually, High's crimes caught up with him. In 1949, he was arrested for the killing of a wealthy man named Archibald Henderson, whose disappearance had raised suspicions. During his interrogation, High confessed not only to killing Henderson, but also several other individuals. At his trial, High's sanity became a significant significant point of contention. He claimed that he was driven by a compulsion to drink human blood and that he believed he could turn his victims' bodies into sludge, allowing him to absorb their wealth. Despite these claims, the court found High guilty and he was sentenced to death. On August 10, 1949, John George High was executed by hanging at Wandsworth Prison in London. In our number 9 spot today, we have Martha Beck and Raymond Fernandez. Martha Beck and Raymond Fernandez, notorious as the Lonely Hearts killers, were a criminal couple who operated in the late 1940s. Using various aliases and personas, Fernandez would respond to Lonely Hearts ads placed by women seeking love or companionship. He would pose as a charming, attractive man, enticing these women into romantic relationships. Beck, playing the role of Fernandez's sister or relative, would eventually join the relationship, gaining the trust of the victims. Once the couple had gained the woman's trust and manipulated them emotionally, they would proceed to rob them of their money, possessions, and even their personal savings. In some cases, the victims' bank accounts would be emptied and their properties sold off. As their greed and desperation increased, the couple turned to killing in order to eliminate any potential witnesses who could expose their criminal activities. Their crimes eventually caught up with them when they targeted a widow named Janet Fay in 1949. Fay's sister became suspicious of Fernandez's intentions and alerted the authorities. The couple was apprehended in Michigan and extradited to New York for trial. During the trial, Martha Beck and Raymond Fernandez confessed to multiple crimes. Both Beck and Fernandez were found guilty and sentenced to death. On March 8, 1951, Martha Beck was executed in the electric chair at Sing Sing Correctional Facility. Raymond Fernandez met the same fate on the same day. In our number 8 spot today, we have Charles Sabraj. Infamously known as the Bikini Killer or the Serpent, was a serial killer active during the 1970s who targeted and preyed upon Western tourists traveling through South Asia. He would approach them, often posing as a gem dealer or an official guiding them through the region. Once he had gained their trust, he would employ various methods to incapacitate and then take the life of his victims. These methods included poisoning, using intoxicating substances, and sometimes even more violent physical methods. He would then rob them of their belongings, including money, passports, and any valuable possessions. Despite being arrested multiple times, he demonstrated remarkable skills in manipulating the legal systems of various countries. He often managed to escape from custody either through bribery, forging documents, or exploiting legal loopholes. However, his luck eventually ran out. In 1976, while attempting to poison a group of French students in New Delhi, he was arrested by authorities. In 1977, he was convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment in India.
India. Over the years, he faced additional legal troubles in countries like Thailand and Nepal, which further extended his time behind bars. In our number 7 spot today, we have Gary Heidneck. This is a name you might be more familiar with than some of the others on this list, and that is because this is the man who inspired the character of Buffalo Bill in the infamous novel Silence of the Lambs. If you're familiar with the literature, you'll know that that's absolutely not a good sign. Gary Heidnick was an American serial killer who committed heinous crimes in the late 1980s. Heidnick kidnapped and tormented six women, imprisoning them in his home. He would lure them into his home under false pretenses, offering food, shelter, or something else that they needed or wanted. Once inside, he subjected them to unimaginable horrors, imprisoning them in a pit dug in the basement of his house, which was later named the Pit of Horrors. Of course, I cannot detail much more of his crimes in order to stay within the guidelines of YouTube, but it's safe to say it was absolutely horrendous. Tragically, two of Heidnick's victims did not survive the ordeal. The remains of Deborah Dudley and Sandra Lindsay were discovered in Heidnick's basement, leading to his arrest in March 1987. The remaining four women were rescued and provided critical testimony against him. During his trial, Heidnick's disturbing and psychopathic behavior became very apparent. He displayed no remorse for his actions and even attempted to act as his own attorney. His behavior and erratic courtroom antics added to the shock and horror surrounding the case. Ultimately, Ultimately, he was found guilty of multiple counts of killing and many other charges as well. He was sentenced to death and spent several years on death row while his case went through numerous appeals. On July 6, 1999, Gary Heidnick was executed by lethal injection at the State Correctional Institute in Rockview, Pennsylvania. In our number 6 spot today, we have Yang Xinhai. Yang, no, also known as the Monster Killer, was one of the most prolific serial killers in China's history. Active from 1999 to 2003, he terrorized multiple provinces by taking the lives of his victims, often targeting entire families. Yang's heinous crimes shocked the nation and left a lasting impact on Chinese society. In 1988, at the age of 20, Yang embarked on his life of crime. He was arrested and imprisoned for a series of burglaries, spending time in a labor camp. Following his release in 1999, he began a spree of violence that would terrify communities throughout China. Yang's MO involved breaking into houses during the night, often in rural areas where security was relatively Lax. He would then kill the occupants and he showed no mercy or remorse. The brutality and frequency of Yang's crimes were unprecedented in China. He showed a complete disregard for human life, often leaving behind scenes of extreme violence and horror. Despite the high number of killings, Yang managed to evade capture for several years. However, in November 2003, Yang's killing spree came to an end. During a routine police inspection, he was caught in the act of committing a burglary. When questioned by the police, Yang confirmed Fest. During his trial, he showed no remorse for his actions and appeared detached from the gravity of his crimes. He was found guilty, and in February 2004, Yang was sentenced to death and executed soon after. In our number five spot today, we have Pedro Rodriguez Filho. Also known as the Padrino Matador, he is a Brazilian serial killer who is believed to have killed over 70 people, mostly other criminals, in the 1960s and 1970s. Pedro had a difficult childhood as his father was a notorious criminal who actually really sadly harmed and killed his mother. This of course had a profound influence on Pedro and his life. This experience is believed to have contributed to his violent behavior later on. Pedro began his crime spree at a super young age and he started with a horrific crime when he killed the vice mayor of his town, who he believed was responsible for the death of his girlfriend. He continued to kill other criminals, often targeting those who had previously wronged him or his family. Pedro was arrested in 1973 and was eventually convicted of killing 71 people. People. Although he was sentenced to 400 years, there was a maximum time of 30 years which Pedro served before being released in 2007. Pedro himself passed away earlier this year in March after being killed by two still unknown suspects. In our number 4 spot today, we have Carl Panzram. Carl Panzram was a notorious criminal and serial killer who committed a wide range of heinous acts during the early 20th century. In his own written account, Panzram claimed responsibility for 21 killings and thousands of of burglaries. Throughout his criminal career, he traveled extensively, committing a slew of violent crimes along the way. This geographical dispersion made it difficult for law enforcement to connect his crimes and build a comprehensive profile of his actions. He targeted individuals who he perceived as easy victims, often taking advantage of their vulnerability or luring them into isolated areas. In 1928, Panzeram was apprehended and arrested for burglary. While in prison, he authored an autobiography in which he provided a chilling first-hand account of his crimes and his deeply anti-social
social mindset. Panzeram's writings offered a disturbing glimpse into the mind of a remorseless and violent individual. On September 5th, 1930, Panzeram was executed by hanging at Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary in Kansas. His execution marked the end of his violent reign, but his written confessions and personal accounts continue to fascinate and disturb those interested in the psychology of criminal behavior. In our number three spot today, we have Stephen Richards. Stephen Richards, also known by his alias Captain Moonlight, is a notorious figure in Australian criminal history. Before adopting his criminal persona, Richards pursued a career as a lay preacher in the Anglican Church. However, his actions were not in line with his religious calling. He engaged in fraudulent activities, including embezzlement and insurance scams, which led to his imprisonment in 1869. During his time in prison, Richards met another criminal named Jesse Nesbitt, and together they formed a bond. Upon their release in 1874, Richards and Nesbitt began leading a gang that engaged in robberies and confrontations with law enforcement. Richards adopted the moniker Captain Moonlight as his alias, and his charismatic personality garnered attention from both the public and the media. He cultivated an image of a romanticized outlaw, drawing inspiration from the legends of American Old West figures like Jesse James and Ned Kelly. In 1879, the gang attempted to rob a bank in New South Wales, resulting in a violent shootout. Several members of the gang, including Nesbitt, were killed and Richards was captured along with the remaining members. Following their capture, Richards and his surviving gang members were put on trial for killing. The prosecution argued that Richards had ordered the shooting of a police officer during the failed bank robbery. Despite his claims of innocence, Richards was convicted and sentenced to death by hanging. In the early morning hours of January 20th, 1880, Stephen Richards met his fate on the gallows at Darlinghurst Goal in Sydney. In our number two spot today, we have Thomas Neil Cream. What a horrible name. So bad. Thomas Cream, dubbed the Lambeth Poisoner, was a Scottish-Canadian doctor who gained notoriety for his terrifying activities during the late 19th century. Cream's preferred method of killing was poisoning, and he targeted his victims, particularly women with whom he had been romantically involved. His crime spree started to crumble after the death of a woman named Matilda Clover, who had been his lover. Suspicion arose regarding her sudden demise, and an investigation was launched, and evidence pointed toward Cream's involvement. However, lacking concrete proof, authorities were unable to bring charges against him. Cream, undeterred, continued his killing spree, but his luck would soon run out. In 1892, Cream's crimes were exposed when he implicated himself in a series of poisonings in a bid to frame others for the killings. His actions drew attention, leading to his arrest and subsequent trial. During the trial, Cream made several erratic outbursts, including accusing others of being the true culprits, but to no avail. In October 1892, Thomas Neal Cream was found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging. On November 15th, 1892, he met his fate at Newgate Prison in London. In our number one spot today, we have Andre Chikatilo. Andre, infamously known as the Butcher of Rostov, was a Soviet serial killer who terrorized Russia for over a decade. Operating between 1978 and 1990, Chikatilo was responsible for taking the lives of at least 53 people, predominantly young and vulnerable individuals. His MO typically involved approaching his victims under the pretense of offering assistance, promising them employment or personal favors. Once he gained their trust, he would then lead them to a secluded location where the horrors would take place. In 1990, his crimes were finally brought to an end. A series of coincidences and the persistence of an investigator named Viktor Burakov led to his identification and subsequent arrest. Despite his initial denial of the crimes, DNA evidence eventually linked him to them, leading to his confession. During his trial in 1992, he was found guilty of 53 killings, although he later claimed to have killed more than 100 victims. Chikatilo was sentenced to death and executed on February 14th, 1994. First, we have Theodore Edward Coney's. Uh, we hear a lot of contemporary stories of folks hiding in people's homes, but this incident happened way back in 1941. This is the case of Theodore Coney's, who secretly inhabited a man's attic before finally committing a horrifying crime. Coney's, a, a vagrant and drifter, sought refuge in the home of Philip Peters, an unsuspecting Denver resident, concealing himself within the confines of Peters' attic. Coney's 
led a precarious existence, surviving by scavenging food from the kitchen and sneaking out at night while Peter slept. However, what began as this eerie invasion of privacy soon escalated to a pretty big tragedy. Driven by desperation and fear of discovery, Coney's mental state began to deteriorate and, and convinced that Peters had become aware of his presence, Coney's hatched a chilling plan to eliminate threat. On a fateful day in March of 1941, he descended from the attic and confronted Peters in his own home by the kitchen. Overpowered by a surge of primal aggression, Coney's viciously attacked Peters, ultimately taking his life in a brutal act. All right, next off we have the X. Uh, ever have that ex-partner who just won't seem to go away? Well, this case took things to a whole new level when Tracy from South Carolina actually found her ex-boyfriend living in her attic 12 years after they had broken up. She had seen nails popping out of her attic and heard noises. At first, she thought there was a poltergeist in her attic, and I'm guessing when she found out the truth, she probably wished it were a paranormal entity rather than her ex-boyfriend from over a decade ago. Yikes. Her sons and nephew found found the man in the back of the attic and he booked it out of there before the police arrived. Now what makes this extra creepy is that the guy had been doing his business up there. There were a bunch of large cups from the fast food restaurant Sonic, all filled with that yellow and brown stuff that comes out of all of our bodies. Surprised, uh, nobody noticed that the second floor of their home must have started smelling like a, like a public bathroom. To make matters even worse, this uh, heartbroken ex-lover also rigged the ceiling vents above Tracy's room in order to spy on her. Nothing, yeah, you know, nothing screams romantic like spying on your ex while taking a poop in their ceiling. Number eight, we have the scammer. Catherine Lang, a 75-year-old resident of Beaufort, South Carolina, had an unsuspected encounter when she visited her newly purchased home. To her astonishment, she discovered a 22-year-old Tigra Shepherd inside the house. Hi, what a name, love that name. Accompanied by a friend and her pets, Lang had brought the property back in October of the previous year, but had yet to move in. Her intention that day was to check the pipes after returning from vacation. It turned out that Shepard had been under the impression that she was legally renting the house. She had recently signed what she believed to be a legitimate lease, which was sent to her by an unnamed woman who claimed to be a realtor on Facebook. Shepard had sent her $1,150 as her first month's rent and deposit. The scammer had assured her that she would receive the keys eventually, but suggested that she could access the house through the back door to begin moving in. Upon discovering each other, uh, both Lang and Shepard contacted the police to report the incident. Uh, now, look, the girl who got scammed, Tigra Shepard, certainly not evil, right? But the scammer, shame on her, whoever she is. Also, never mess with someone named Tigra. She'll call the Thundercats on you. Miguel Lua, back in December, 2010, an anonymous woman residing in Modesto, California began experiencing a series of bizarre events within her own home. Growing increasingly concerned, she strongly suspected that her ex-boyfriend, a 27-year-old man named Miguel Lua, was somehow involved. Fueled by suspicion, she believed that Lua had unlawfully entered her residence. One fateful night, as the woman plugged in her cell phone to charge it overnight, she later discovered it had vanished. Disturbed by this occurrence, she promptly contacted the authorities and they initiated a thorough search of her house. To their surprise, the investigation led them to the attic where they stumbled upon Lua, cunningly concealed beneath layers of insulation. It seemed he'd been lurking there for quite some time, spying on his ex-girlfriend. The missing cell phone, as it turned out, had been taken by, it was Lua, he took it, shocker, in an attempt to monitor her communications and verify if she was in contact with other dudes. Consequently, Lua's actions led to his arrest, revealing that this wasn't the first offense of trespassing into an ex-girlfriend's home without consent. In fact, just a few months prior in July of 2010, he had been apprehended for a similar crime involving another former partner who had previously obtained two restraining orders against him. It's scary to imagine what he would have done if he uh, found something he didn't like on that phone. 
Number six, the attic man. Back in 2008, the Ference family in Pennsylvania began experiencing peculiar occurrences in their house just days before Christmas. Initially, Stacy Ference attributed the strange sounds to their cats or one of her three children. However, on Christmas Day, their suspicions grew and several items went missing on two separate occasions. Once in the afternoon and then again in the evening, it became evident that someone had broken into their home twice targeting their Christmas presents, but it wasn't the Grinch. Concerned, the family promptly contacted the police to report the incidents. The following day, an intriguing discovery unfolded as his footprints were found in one of the bedroom closets leading up to the attic. Authorities were alerted and they arrived with a police dog. Together, ventured into the attic where they stumbled upon a 21-year-old Stanley Carter. To everyone's surprise, Carter was wearing Stacy's sweatshirt and sneakers along with her daughter's pants. Not sure how you fit into those, but as the story unfolded, it was revealed that Carter had been staying with neighbors which shared an attic space with the Ference family's home. At number five, we have John M. Dubis. This is a stalker story, not the only one that's going to show up on this list as we've seen. I guess the two uh, ex lovers are kind of stalkerish. Anyway, John M. Dubis was a pretty persistent stalker of Jennifer Lopez. Due to his history of stalking her, Lopez had already obtained an order of protection against the 49-year-old man. However, this did not deter Dubis from breaking into the pool house of Lopez's luxurious mansion located in Southampton, New York. On August 8, 2013, the staff at the house made a startling discovery when they found Dubis on the property. The police were contacted and it was revealed that Dubis had managed to reside within the pool house for an entire week without being noticed. That's tenacity. Despite the presence uh, of those you know, security measures, to make matters even more insane, Dubis had taken pictures all around the property and posted them on Facebook, showcasing uh, you know, his unwelcome presence. Posted all kinds of crazy stuff. He shared receipts that showed he was in JLo's area. He took selfies, wrote that he was married to her. He was just living this whole fantasy life for a week, minus Lopez actually being there. Thankfully, she she was not present at the time. Dubis faced uh, multiple charges, including burglary, criminal contempt, and stalking as a consequence of his actions. All right, in Yelm, Washington, a 73-year-old woman named Velma Kellen found herself puzzled by the unusual occurrences happening around her home. She would often discover her back gate open. She noticed a peculiar uh, smell that resembled cigarette smoke, but had a strange quality to it. As winter arrived, Kellen started noticing problems with the heating and called in a repairman to inspect the ventilation system. During the repairman's investigation beneath the house, everything quickly snapped into place. Covered the that someone had been squatting in the crawl space. Not like exercise and squatting, but they had been, you know, living down there. And they'd been utilizing the ventilation system for warmth. This unknown individual had tampered with the vent by cutting it. Inside the crawl space, there were alcohol bottles, and though the exact duration of the squatting situation remains uncertain, it's suspected that the person or persons have been living there for about a year. Under the bed. Late on Wednesday night, a Seattle couple arrived at their apartment only to be confronted with a scene of utter chaos. Lotion was smeared all over the doorknobs, a can of paint had been poured into the toilet, junk mail was torn open, and the soles of numerous pairs of shoes had been removed. The couple immediately contacted the police. Strangely enough, nothing appeared to have been stolen though, leaving the couple puzzled and even considering the possibility of something supernatural having occurred. The officers were pretty perplexed, but left after a 45 minute investigation. Later, Brian shifted the bed slightly to retrieve a bracelet from the floor when he suddenly heard an unsettling noise emanating from beneath the mattress, a growling sound. The couple ran out of their home and contacted the police. Once again, officers re-entered the house and came back out accompanied by a disheveled, wide-eyed woman. How they did not check under the bed in that 45 minute investigation uh, makes no sense to me. Anyway, they got her. The O'Neills continued to assess the aftermath, making even more disturbing discoveries though. They found a hypodermic needle concealed within their bed sheets and locks of the woman's hair scattered throughout the house. And finally, a knife was discovered beneath the bed, a tool she had apparently used in an attempt to dismantle the box springs. At number two, we have the stalker. Carlo Castanellos Feria and Michelle Fredenberg Onion crossed paths while working together at a hospital in Washington. 
Washington, D.C. Carlo, a valet, developed a, an unhealthy obsession with, uh, with Michelle. This obsession eventually led him down a dark path of stalking. At one point, he managed to swipe her keys and make copies of them before returning them unnoticed. Then he entered Michelle's residence and planted a camera on a desk in her bedroom. When she and her boyfriend would arrive at the apartment, Carlo would hide beneath the bed. This alarming charade continued for two whole days until the boyfriend eventually discovered him. Upon apprehension, it was revealed that Carlo had stashed various items under the bed, including con latex gloves, a change of clothes, and a power cord. He was then arrested and a search of his home uncovered even more disturbing stuff. Among the findings were six framed pictures of Michelle, an additional stack of unframed ones, and a video taken uh, from her previous wedding. And coming in at number one, we have the case of Daniel LaPlante. Uh, following a brief dating period with Tina Bowen, 16 year old, Daniel LaPlante gained unauthorized entry into the Bowen home, initiating a series of terrifying events. From a narrow crawl space, he tormented the family by impersonating a ghost of their deceased mother, changed TV channels, he rearranged items, uh, left disturbing messages on the walls. Uh, the situation escalated when he pinned a family photograph to the wall with a knife. On December 8th, 1986, the girls returned home to discover someone had used their toilet, prompting Frank Bowen, the father, to search the house. He found LaPlante dressed in a Native American style jacket and ninja mask, armed with a hatchet and forced the family into a bedroom. Tina Bowen managed to escape through a window and alert the police. And two days later, LaPlante was discovered hiding in a triangular space in the cellar where he had been living for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> 